name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. When I was a youngster, uh, my neighbor, Mike, a couple of years older than I was, and he had an um, older sister. She was about five years older. And one of the great sports that young boys have is to torment older sisters. And we were engaged in this. And, of course, that's how young boys show their love to older women anyway, is, you know, by tormenting them. But apparently Mike's mother didn't think that that was all that good. And we didn't know she was listening around in the corner. She thought we had gone quite a bit too far. And she was known to have a little temper anyway. And she came steaming around the corner. And she gave us a tongue lashing like I had never heard at home. She gutted us like a couple of little fish. We were flopping around after that. It, was, it reminded me of uh, when, when Deborah and I went out to North Carolina a few years ago, and we saw that the, it was kind of a museum where Blackbeard the pirate was captured and killed, and they had this, that whip, and it had the nine leather cords from it with little pieces of metal in the end. It's called the Cat of Nine Tails. They use it for ship's discipline, and when they would whip somebody, it would take little bits of flesh out with it. That's what I felt like from her words. She lashed us with words like the cat of nine tails. This morning, our epistle lesson is again from the book of James. Last week, James talked to us about practical congregational life considerations. He said, don't be showing favoritism to the rich. Uh, you know, take care of everybody. And then in this text, as we move on, he talks about the power of words and the taming of the tongue. The tongue, he said, is a small, small organ, and yet how much power it wields. And he uses three comparisons. He says, the tongue is kind of like a rudder on a ship, a little, a little part of the ship, and it can guide a whole huge ship. Or the bit, a little piece of metal like this in a horse's mouth, you can direct a 1,200-pound animal. Or his last analogy is the Smokey the Bear analogy, that it's, you know, a spark can start a whole blaze, and the tongue is a fire. So he's saying caution in speech is paramount. In fact, he says, if you can control your tongue, then you are uh, perfect in every other thing in living because nobody can control the tongue. He said it's, uh, a, it's, it's a matter, of, a measure of Christian maturity if you can control your tongue. Now, there are a lot of people who would, you know, try to tell you that it's, it's not all that big a deal. When I was a little kid, we used to have a, a nursery rhyme that people would say on the playground. You'll remember it. It goes like this. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but... There you go. Yeah. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words or names, you could use either one, will never hurt me. Well, that's a little boy whistling in the dark, pretending he's not afraid. That's, that, you know, that's not true. What it, what it should be is sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can really do some damage. That's the way the little rhyme should go. Words are powerful. You know that uh, even our body reacts to words that are harsh or shaming or demeaning or derogatory. There are 24,000 little cells in the limbic system that are stimulated when we hear something that's shaming and demeaning. And those cells stimulate glands to secrete hormones in our body like cortisol and all kinds of stuff like that that gets us ready for fight or flight. We're ready to do something. The downside is that all of those hormones also take away our immunity to other diseases. And so when we're stressed like that, we tend to get sick. It lasts for 24 hours in the body. So we can say, I don't care what people say, but our body says otherwise. And, you know, a lot of times people will say, well, I don't care what, what other people say about me. Oh, come on. Unless you're a total sociopath, it does make a difference to you what other people say. Now, let's be real about this. Now, I, I grant you it makes a difference who is saying what to you. And there's an old song that some of you might remember. It goes like this. You always hurt the one you love, the one you shouldn't hurt at all. Remember that? It's because you can only really hurt the one you love, and the one you love can only really hurt you. Strangers, you can kind of blow that off. But if your spouse thinks you're weird, that's a little different. If your kids think you're stupid, that, that, that kind of hurts a little bit, your grandkids. It is the people who are closest to you who can damage you the most with words, and they do. They're also the people who can build you up the most and edify you. The body also reacts 
all those little nerves in the limbic that react to praise too. Even God wants to be praised. So don't pretend that you don't want that. Even God himself likes to be praised. And that's, that's a good way to go. I, I was reading some uh, marriage counseling stuff. And there's a guy in there who was doing research. He was a marital counselor. And I don't know how they did it. They observed couples over a long period of time. But he said that uh, he was measuring, and they were counting how many negative uh, demeaning statements that partners would use with each other in marriage. And he said the interesting thing was that it didn't matter how much people loved each other or how much they had in common or how much their, their moral standards and values matched up. What seemed to make a difference in which marriages survived and which didn't over a long period of time was those that survived had only five negative kinds of statements per hundred statements and that those that didn't survive had ten per hundred. Isn't that interesting? He said that seemed to be the only thing that made a difference was the kind of words that people used to each other in the marriage. Strange. The other thing that is very important to remember is that children, children hear words and certainly I've worked with enough dysfunctional families over the years to know that words that are said in dysfunctional families are powerful because children don't know if it's the truth or not. All they know is big people are saying it, so it must be true. If they're saying I'm, I'm bad, they must be right and I must be wrong. You know, that's how shame works with children. We have to be very, very careful of that. And I remember so many terrible things that that family members said to children and they grew up believing they were true and then they have to work hard as an adult to go back and look at those messages those words they heard to say was that really true about me am I worthless and stupid and bad or is that just sick people saying sick stuff about me yeah it's that well then they have a chance to get well so we have to be very very cautious on that uh, a, a, a word of praise for a kid works wonders. I, I shared this example in the ChemDep lecture series. I was trying to get my son Clint to mow the lawn, and he just would always put it off and kind of, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, come on, it's time to mow the lawn. Come on, get, get, get at it. And finally, I said to myself, you know, I, 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 can, I know better than this. I can parent better than this. I thought, I'm going to just lay this responsibility on him and then praise him when he does good instead of, you know, ride his trail when he was doing bad. So <clears throat> I sat him down. I said, this is your responsibility now. And, you know, we all have our stuff we do in the family. And, and this is one of yours. So I'm not going to say anything. You, you take it over. Oh, okay. So I waited. And I waited. And the lawn got longer. <laughs> and I... I chewed my fingers off, but I didn't say anything. And finally, he mowed the lawn. It was clumpy, but he mowed the lawn. And then I sat him down. I said, you know, I appreciate the fact that I did not have to say anything to you about mowing the lawn, even though I wanted to desperately. I'm, I'm glad I didn't have to say anything to you about this and that you were responsible enough to mow the lawn. And this is the kind of thing that I will remember a little bit later when you want to borrow the car. This is the kind of stuff that I will hearken back to and remember how responsible you are. And he puffed up like a bullfrog. And he said, yep. And that was the last time I ever had to say anything about the lawn. So wh what I'm getting at is that instead of just, you know, when we're parents, sometimes it's hard because, you know, we see something wrong, we jump on it. And it, it's... it's Probably it's better to be a grandparent because you have a little distance on this thing and you can look at it and go, well, you know, okay, let's, let's just listen and, and give a little praise and, and try to do things that way. And, uh, we, you know, it, it's, it's hard to remember that sometimes. We have a sign in our house somewhere. I don't know, Deborah switches signs every once in a while, but we have one that says, that says nothing improves a child's hearing like praise. Do we still have that? Okay. I see. Okay. Very good. Keep that one. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing.
Nothing improves a child's hearing like praise. And guess what? Nothing improves a child of God's hearing like praise either. God is careful with his word. The word made flesh. When God gives us a word, it's more than a word. It's an action. It's, it's sending his only genetic son for his adopted sons and his adopted daughters. That's his word to us. You know, like if somebody says, oh, you better go in. The boss is going to give us the word. Well, that may not be good. But maybe the boss is going to give us the word. Hey, you all got Christmas bonuses. Woohoo! Okay. All right. Well, it's kind of like that. God gives us his word. And there are people who haven't heard those words. Like I said, some grew up in dysfunctional, terrible families. And they, every time they lowered their bucket down into the family well, they came up with dust. Well... How about taking your bucket off and hook it on some other well and lower it down there? Maybe you can get what Jesus called living waters in that well. So if you haven't heard these words, words again are powerful. To speak of mere words is like, to me, is like saying mere dynamite. Uh, just, if you haven't heard those words, may, maybe you need to hear them again. I'm going to give you some some quotes and some paraphrases of what God has said to us, his words to us. Listen, listen to these. Let these words wash over you a little bit this morning. I love you. There's nobody like you. Whatever you are and whatever you've done, I don't care. It is forgiven. You are mine. You're a part of me and I'm a part of you and you always will be. I cannot love you more, and I will never love you less. When you walk through the fire, you will not be consumed. When you walk through the waters, you will not be harmed. I am with you. I love you. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.